How much of Under the Banner of Heaven is actually true? The story revolves around the Lafferty family, which is headed by the authoritarian patriarch Amon Lafferty and includes his six sons, Ron, Dan, Robin, Sam, Jacob, and Alan. After the passing of their father, the Lafferty brothers, who were already motivated by their fundamentalist Mormon views, embraced an even more extreme strain of Mormonism in the shape of a passionate offshoot group known as the School of Prophets. It turns out that Alan's wife, Brenda Lafferty, was the first significant victim of this radicalization. The more traditional beliefs held by Brenda's husband's brothers are in direct opposition to the more moderate and progressive Mormonism practiced by Brenda. As a result, Dan and Ron Lafferty, two of Brenda's brother-in-laws, have made the choice to destroy Brenda in the name of God. Under the Banner of Heaven, a story of violent faith written by Krakauer in 2003, serves as the inspiration for a significant portion of the miniseries, which is based on real-life events. Dustin Lance Black, a screenwriter who has won an Academy Award, is a former Mormon who broke away from the church when he was a teenager. Detective Jeb Pyre, a faithful mainstream Mormon who was left questioning and wrestling with his faith as dark shades of Mormonism pop up during his investigation into the murders of Brenda and Erica, is one of the fictional elements that Black incorporates into the narrative of the story. Pyre is forced to reconsider his more traditional ideas during the course of the inquiry. These beliefs stand in contrast to the extreme version followed by the Lafferty's, which resulted in the death of an innocent mother and her newborn. Another fictitious figure who plays a role in the story is Bill Taba, Pyre's colleague. He's a seasoned investigator who has just moved to Salt Lake City from Las Vegas. Bill is the cynical skeptic who doesn't buy into any of Pyre's affection for Mormonism and who is unable to get his brain around the customs and religious regulations of the Mormon faith. In addition to these two fabricated characters, the identities of several members of the Lafferty family have been modified. Other members of the Lafferty family, such as Robin, Sam, and Jacob, are fictitious. However, Brenda, Alan, Dan, Ron, Matilda, and Diana Lafferty are all represented using their true names. Throughout the course of the seven episodes of the miniseries, a few additional historical inaccuracies come to light. Nonetheless, these discrepancies alone are not sufficient to suggest that the whole plot isn't based on actual events. It would seem that these alterations were done for the purpose of enhancing the drama. The opening scene of the first episode consists of Detective Pyre being summoned to the site of the murder of Brenda and her 15-month-old daughter. Based on Pyre's response, the crime scene was very gory, much as it was in real life. The other portions of the show are mostly faithful adaptations of the source material and actual events, including the fact that Brenda is a former beauty queen and TV journalist, and that Dan's failure to pay taxes ultimately led to his incarceration just as it was portrayed in Krakauer's book. However, despite the fact that the Lafferty's were loud about their anti-tax attitude, as the book indicates, there's no evidence to establish that they were in fact members of the organized anti-tax organization known as Patriots for Freedom as was portrayed in the miniseries. The fourth episode depicts Dan's arrest in a manner that is almost entirely accurate. The only change that was made was that Dan's wife, Matilda, was present in the car with him when he was pulled over by the police to witness the arrest. This took place after Dan was driving recklessly and caused the police to pull him over. Jenny, the small daughter of Sam Lafferty, was never questioned by authorities at the police station about her father or her uncles while they were there. The producers of the program decided to present these flashbacks of Alan and Brenda's wedding from an altogether fresh point of view in episode 3, and they did it by adding this particular element. Due to the fact that the names of some of the Lafferty brothers were altered during the course of the series, it is unclear who is meant to be Jenny's biological father. No kid of the Lafferty brothers was reportedly questioned during any of the investigations that were conducted into the real-life case, since it is stated that no minors were involved in any of the inquiries. The scenario in the third episode in which one of the Lafferty's is pointing a pistol at the police at a cabin while shouting Bible verses is also fictitious. Again, this was the creator's way of highlighting how unreasonably extreme the Lafferty brothers were in their beliefs. 
In episode 4, Diana Lafferty sends a letter to the LDS prophet and to Bishop Lowe, asking for their assistance in addressing the problematic actions and beliefs shown by the Lafferty brothers. At the very end of episode 5, the patriarch of the Lafferty family is ill and nearing the end of his life. He ultimately passes away as a result of Ron's refusal to provide him with medical care. As he does so, Ron is reminded of times in their childhood when his father would do the same thing to them. Krakauer reveals in his book that, in typical Mormon tradition, Watson was opposed to taking medicine or attending physicians. As a direct consequence of this, his family chose not to provide him with any drugs in deference to his views. When seen through the lens of the Mormon Church, the novel Under the Banner of Heaven would not have been considered complete if it had avoided broaching the sensitive subject of homosexuality. The LTS Polygamist Society of John Bryant, which Ron Lafferty later becomes engaged with, accepted homosexuality and sexual freedom in general. In the sixth episode, there's a scene in which Bryant becomes intimate with Ron in a hot tub after he has baptized him. This scene is included in an attempt to highlight his commitment to the community. The spine-inducing miniseries comes to a horrific conclusion with the seventh episode, which ultimately sheds light on the individuals responsible for the deaths of Brenda and her young daughter. In the events that really took place, as described in Krakauer's book, Brenda never sent a letter to Diana with the date July 24, 1984, which was the same day that Diana passed away. Following the news of Brenda's passing, the miniseries depicts Diana reading the letter in question, and as a result, she makes an effort to rescue Matilda from the clutches of her abusive husband, Dan. After Ron's indoctrination into the School of the Prophets, Diana filed for divorce from him, and for a while, it seemed that she was safe from Ron. In contrast to Diana, Matilda seems to have reconciled herself to her unfortunate circumstances by continuing to live with her polygamist husband, Dan. It seemed as if the scene in which Dan and Ron were taken into custody by Detective Pyre had been altered very little from how things really transpired. It is true that the cops apprehended them in a casino in Nevada. But according to the Deseret News, neither Ron nor Dan was really attempting to murder the other person at the casino. Instead, they were merely waiting in line at the casino. However, Ron's attempt on his brother's life took place not before or during their arrest, but rather after both of them had been taken into custody and were housed in the same cell at the Utah County Jail. Ron had made an effort to murder Dan after convincing him that he had had a revelation from God commanding him to do it and Dan had agreed with Ron's reasoning. And that's it! Leave a comment below telling me what you think about the show. Click the like button if you'd like to see more videos just like the one you're now watching. Also, don't forget to subscribe to the channel! I'll be waiting for you in the next video!